Good morning and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I am the Reverend Mandy Beal. I am the senior, senior member, no. <laughs> Everything is fine. <laughs> the senior minister of this congregation. I am joined today in the leadership of this worship service by our co-directors of music ministry, Abha and Stephen Deering, as well as worship associate, Judy Amir. We also have technical support from our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantagas. Our worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030 and then later posted on Facebook. BUC is a spiritual home for all people of goodwill. Today is our delayed Daffodil Sunday. That is a celebration of BUC's welcoming congregation status. A welcoming congregation is one that has uh, committed itself to the work of being inclusive of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender and queer individuals and their families. Our welcoming congregation status was renewed this program year. We typically wear yellow and green for this celebration. I have chosen today to wear black in solidarity with the black lives that have been lost to police brutality and the ongoing resistance efforts. BEC is also a green sanctuary congregation. That is a designation meaning that we are also committed to environmental justice work. And although there is no such designation for racial justice work, we are deeply committed to that as well. This is just a quick reminder that you are currently on mute and we ask that you stay on mute to prevent distractions and unwanted noise during the service. And we usually have a virtual coffee hour after worship services, but we won't today. Instead, today is our annual meeting. I know everyone is very excited about that. When you leave this Zoom meeting, I encourage you to please get a snack and a cup of coffee and then click on a separate link to join the annual meeting. That link can be found on the BDC website. Please join the meeting at 1145. We have a few announcements this week. First, as many of you are aware, the Blue Door classroom needs to be uh, fitted with a new roof. We have to have a completely new roof and the red door needs significant roof repair. You can help by joining our Raise the Roof fundraiser. The good news is that we have some money through the PPP funds and also we have a gift for matching contributions. We have also scheduled a Raise the Roof Zoomathon party for Friday, June 26th at 7 p.m. The Zoomathon will include lots of special guests and live music. Mark your calendars for that very special event. Second, the humanists of BUC are meeting tonight at 7 p.m. The featured speaker is Professor Mike Witte, who will be giving a talk entitled Defending Democracy from Theocracy. Zoom access information is available on the BUC website. And finally, just a note that we will celebrate Flower Communion next week. This is obviously going to be a little different online, but please bring a flower anyway, and we will figure it out. Thank you again for joining us this morning or whenever you're watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit, and it's good to be together again. With that, our service will begin.
today we worship in our separate homes, but we are joined with a multitude of Unitarian Universalists in lighting our chalice. And to get that, that lighter from the Shrek family. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, so I'll get a different lighter. We'll do that during the hymn. We'll pretend this chalice is lit. This is going to be a great service. I'm really excited. All the weird is out of the way. We're going to be fine. So we light this chalice as an affirmation that love is love and all genders are whole and holy. Please join in singing, We Are a Gentle, Angry People. Jonathan Chapman. Recently, I ordered a four foot tall rainbow bunnies for my church. And just after I hit order, I wondered if we really needed them. Later that day, one of my parishioners sent me a picture taken in front of a local church. On the lawn was an enormous banner with a picture of the Holy Family and the message. God's marriage equals one man plus one woman. Often people ask me why my church constantly hangs banners welcoming folks, particularly the LGBTQ community. They wondered why we are always lugging out our rainbows. This is why. Because you see, every church says everyone is welcome. But many of that make that a conditional welcome. You're welcome, but not your relationship, or who you love, or how you look, or how you think, or how you believe. Most churches don't put up banners like the one I saw, but many aren't far off from sharing the same sentiment. Listen, people can think what they want and believe what they want. I, I don't have to agree with everyone, and they don't have to agree with me. But as long as there are congregations willing to limit God's welcome, ours will work hard to widen that welcome. And as long as there are churchgoers who question the depth of God's love, we will keep hoisting our banners and opening our doors that proclaim its breadth. The truth is, we will fall short. We do fall short, but we keep trying. Because you see, there are people in the world who wonder if God could really love them. If God could love them despite who they are. And in case that's you, yes. There's no despite about it. God could love you. God does love you. 
and so does this church. This is a house of memory and hope and love and justice, a house that we have created. Let there be an offering in support of this beloved community. Your contributions can be sent using Venmo with username at BUCMI or through our website. Giving on either platform is easy and it is free. If you choose not to do it during the offertory, please do it later today. You can also just put a, che a check in the mail to us. That's always welcome. I ask you to consider how much you've relied on BUC, however long you've been here, but especially during the past three months and do what you can to support our good work. Please give generously. Our offertory this morning is from a show called A Man of No Importance. The song is Love Who You Love, and the lyrics are by Lynn Ahrens, music by Stephen Flaherty. I'm not one to lecture, how could I dare? Someone like me, who's been mainly nowhere, but in my experience, be as it may, you just have to love who you love, you just have to love who you love. Your common sense tells you best not begin, but your full heart cannot help plunging in, and nothing and no one can stand in your way. You just have to love who you love. You just have to love who you love. People can be hard sometimes, and their words can cut so deep. Choose the one you choose, love, and don't lose a moment's sleep. Who can tell you who to want? Who can tell you what you were destined to be? Take it from me. There's no fault in loving, no call for shame. Everyone's heart does exactly the same. And once you believe that, you'll learn how to say, I love who I love, who I love. Then just go and love who you love. We enter now into the time of our service that we have set aside for centering practices such as prayer and reflection. I invite you to join me in that attitude as we hear a reading of joys and sorrows from our congregation. We begin with a set of joys. First uh, is Sheehern and Toby Kubian happily celebrated their fifth wedding anniversary last weekend. We wish them many more. Another joy, this from Nancy and Richard Schmidt, who yesterday celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. They were married at age 20 while they were still in college, and some people thought they were too young. They say that they grew up together and they're still going strong. Another joy, our very own Abby Shrek won the 8th Congressional District Art Competition, which means that her art will hang in the halls of the U.S. Capitol for a year. She will be flown to D.C. for a ceremony where she will receive a private tour and meet Representative Alyssa Slotkin. Congratulations to Abby. And last, we have a note of deep sorrow from Jesse Beal, and I think many of us join in sharing this sorrow. June 12th marked the fourth anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting. 49 people were killed and 53 were injured in that act of anti-gay violence. On this year, on June 12th, the Trump administration overturned a piece of legislation that protected transgender people from medical discrimination. 
This essentially allows medical providers to refuse care to transgender people, and this happening in the time of a pandemic. Also on that same day, two black transgender women were reported murdered. I invite you to move further with me into a spirit of prayer and reflection. Spirit of life, interdependent web that connects us all, compassionate one, author of diversity. Today we gather for a celebration of welcoming the LGBTQ community into the heart of this congregation. We do that in a week with so many actions of violence taken against our community. One of our heroes who has written a canon uh, that many people in their 40s, 30s, 20s and beyond love, JK Rowling this week took it upon herself to make several anti-trans statements that were unnecessary and intentionally mean. May we find a way to move forward and finding joy in our communities and finding meaning in those works while also letting go of someone who has worked so hard to hurt us. Also this week, the, Dep the Department of Housing and Urban Development has made a ruling that single occupancy housing, which is for people who are homeless, will now only be granted on the basis of birth assigned sex, leading more transgender people into a life without homes and a life of extreme vulnerability. In this time that is meant to be a celebration, we know also that our black siblings are being persecuted. This is a time of extreme violence, or at least a time when that violence is being revealed. And as people work hard to bring more awareness to that violence and overturn it, they are met with more violence and we are stuck in a time that is painful and hard. May this community be a shelter for us and a system of accountability for us that we continue to work for greater inclusion of all people, bringing us all into a place of love and a place of value. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. I was invited to a meeting of people who wanted to discuss BUC becoming a welcoming congregation. At the time, I had no understanding of what that meant, and neither did most of the other 25 people who crowded the room that evening. The majority of those, however, questioned the need for this as, we don't know any gay people in this church, or of course we welcome everybody, so why do we need to do this? We spent over a year talking, sometimes crying. We listened to people from the gay community and we began to understand. 
and we educated the congregation through discussion groups and worship services. Finally, we earned the designation of being a welcoming congregation. But that was many years ago. And the world has changed. The language has changed. Congregation has changed. Our conversations about LGBTQ persons have evolved. And yes, we now know that members, leaders, and friends of our congregation are part of the LGBTQ community. Welcoming Congregation Renewal Committee provided us with so many opportunities to learn more, experience more, to love more. Yes, some of us still struggle with the language, but we are trying. We are not done, but we are on the right path. Today is Daffodil Sunday, and it is an annual celebration of BUC's history as a welcoming congregation. And as Judy just told us, in 1994, our church made a bold statement that it was fully inclusive of gays and lesbians. The welcoming congregation worked for years, as Judy described, bringing the congregation on board through education and coalition building. All of that culminated in a successful congregational vote. In order to draw attention to this declaration, our building was wrapped in yellow caution tape, designating it a hate-free zone. And as was hoped, this striking visual caught the attention of local media and that gave BUC a public platform to make its welcoming status widely known. Two men behind our congregation, living in the condos behind our congregation, were so taken by this gesture of inclusion that they secretly planted daffodil bulbs in tropic woods. In the spring, those daffodils bloomed and our church was so overwhelmed at this expression of gratitude from this couple that the daffodil became the unofficial symbol of our congregation. Over the past year, a committee of lay leaders successfully worked to renew BUC's welcoming congregation status. Over the decades that the UUA has offered the welcoming congregation certification, it has been noted that many congregations achieve welcoming congregation status and then don't continue learning about and actively working on LGBTQ inclusivity. The welcoming renewal program has been created for congregations to stay engaged in this work. Like the original process, the steps, the steps for welcome renewal include educational events, community outreach, and acknowledging days of special importance to the LGBTQ community. The story of Daffodil Sunday has been told now for 26 years, recounted annually for young people and adults. This is a story that most BUCers know by heart. And yet, some questions and concerns about BUC's welcoming status have been raised during my tenure as your senior minister. And I've decided to dedicate today's sermon to responding to these concerns. We have a few questions and a couple of statements. Question one, we already did welcoming congregation. Why do we need to do it again? Well, as, as Judy just told us, issues facing the LGBTQ community are always evolving as is language and our own understanding of our own identities. For example, the word queer is widely used among people of my generation and younger. That word can make us, um, well, it can make older UUs feel uncomfortable because it was previously and sometimes still is used as a slur. But over the years, the word queer has been reclaimed and it is often preferred because it provides space for acknowledging gender nonconformity. It also has political implications. Trying to stay current with the language of the LGBTQ community is one important way that congregations demonstrate a commitment to inclusivity. 
1993 and 1994, BUC did a tremendous amount of work to understand how LGBTQ identities have been marginalized in society and especially in religious spaces. Also in 1994, I celebrated my 15th birthday. The world has changed a lot since 1994. When you started this work, I was 12. None of us have the same life now that we did a quarter century ago. This is also true of the LGBTQ community and our church. A welcome renewal year exploring how things have changed over the past 26 years is a healthy practice. In fact, we might consider doing it more often. Question two that I have heard a lot. Why can't we just say that all people of goodwill are welcome? I get it a lot. So I'll start by asking, what do we mean when we say welcome? Do we mean allowed to exist? Or do we mean warmly embraced and brought into the center of things? A passive tolerance is not a welcome. In church, a true welcome is fully acknowledging someone and celebrating all of who they are. That is no passive statement of everyone is welcome, but a dedication to actively trying to understand their challenges in the world and again, in religious settings. It's letting an historically marginalized group know that they are seen and valued even if they are vastly outnumbered in the congregation. Many Unitarian Universalist LGBTQ identified people left Christian churches because we were not fully included, including myself. I was tolerated in those spaces. I was allowed to be there. No one told me that I had to leave, but they weren't excited that I was there. They did not encourage my participation or my leadership in anything. Nobody acknowledged my relationship. I, and others like me, left that stifling space of allowed but not welcome, hoping to find a warm, well-informed, and enthusiastic welcome within these sheltering walls. That means I'd like for you to understand a little bit about my identity, the struggles I may have faced, and the words that I use to describe myself. These are the goals of a welcoming congregation program. And it has to be said, the term welcoming congregation is confusing. It should be called something that includes the phrase LGBTQ to make it clear that that is specifically what a welcoming congregation is. And I think the fact that the UUA was afraid to give the program such a name says a lot about how many congregations actually supported this at the beginning. Not a lot. This is a testament to BUC's position at the time, as well as an indictment on a mealy mouth stance from the UUA. Question three, why isn't there a UUA anti-racist program? That is an excellent question that I've been hearing a lot of in the past month. It's my understanding that after a lot of consideration, the people who work in the realms of UU anti-racist and multiculturalism chose not to pursue the certificate model. As previously stated, many congregations achieved welcoming status congregation and then became complacent about doing that work. In order to prevent that attitude in anti-racism work, congregations are encouraged instead to engage with racial justice work in an ongoing manner using materials created by and centering people of color. White people love to check off boxes and then say, we did it. And this is a way of preventing that. Also, there's a movement underway to adopt an eighth principle that is specifically anti-racist. I am fully in support of that movement. Moving on to the statements. Statement one, I am a straight, white, cisgender person in my 60s. My identities are not mentioned in the welcoming words and that makes me feel left out. 
When I became your senior minister, I realized that there was some confusion about the term welcoming congregation, especially in that welcoming statement given at the beginning of worship services. The welcoming statement that I inherited said something about being a welcome, welcoming congregation and everyone is welcome here. As I worked with the worship associates and other leaders, it became clear that BUC, like so many other congregations, had lost the meaning of a capital W, capital C, welcoming congregation. And I felt that we needed to clear this up by explicitly stating the meaning of welcoming congregation in the welcoming statement. People like Judy worked so hard to earn that certification, I wanted their good work to be acknowledged. Later, Green Sanctuary Ministries asked to be included in the welcome too. They also have worked so hard to earn a certification, so it was added. And then later on, people of color in the congregation asked to be included as well, so a line or two acknowledging our commitment to racial justice was added. It should be noted that our entire worship associate team has contributed to updating our welcoming statement on an ongoing basis, and that a lot of the legwork was done by Teresa Honnold and Ed Sharples. A welcoming statement is a brief on the congregation, it is a way of telling new people who we are and what we value. It's also a reminder of those things for our established long timers. A welcoming statement is not meant to be a census of the congregation. If you can look around the room or now scroll through our Zoom screens on a Sunday morning and see a lot of people who share your, identi your identities, then you know that you are welcome here. There is plenty of evidence that you are valued and understood by the other people who have gathered to make sacred space. Also, I ask you to recall that becoming a welcoming congregation requires a congregational vote. Ask yourself if you've ever been in a community where a group of people who share an identity that vastly outnumbered your own went through a learning process about your identity and then took a vote on whether or not they wanted to explicitly include you in their community. If that's never been you, perhaps there doesn't need to be a statement specifically naming your value at the beginning of the worship service. Your value is already made clear by having a majority stake in the identity and the culture of the congregation. I think what truly underlies the concern about straight white baby boomers feeling left out is anxiety about a changing congregation, and I am a symbol of that change. I have a lot of empathy for that, and I want to ensure you that I am not trying, nor am I going to, leave you behind. I don't think anyone in this congregation is trying to leave you behind or to edge you out. And yet, we have to start making room for people who are not straight white baby boomers to participate in our church at all levels, including leadership. Church is not a pie. As other identities get a larger piece of participation, it doesn't mean that you get a smaller piece. You will always have a home here. Our religious tradition, our church, the human heart are limitless. There is room here for us all. The second statement that I have heard is, you have changed the church's fairly diverse social action agenda to be one focused militantly on the LGBTQ matters, which minimizes the far larger and more pressing problems of the metro, of the metro Detroit area. That is slightly paraphrased only for anonymity from a letter that I recently received. It included the word militant. I did not add that. Now, I want to dismiss this as one angry person, but I've heard other softer versions of this concern over the years, their year and a half. And I have to admit, 
that this one hurts. It hurts not because, well, it does hurt because it digs at me personally, but it, it hurts mostly because it's not true and because of the underlying assumption. This statement indicates that I have a singular justice concern at the expense of all of the other justice concerns or that I have a desire to make things about myself or perhaps a combination of both. I don't set the agenda of our social and environmental justice committee. In fact, I don't think I could. Have you met anybody on the social and environmental justice committee? <laughs> that's, that's not gonna happen. Um, but also, I, you know, I've been to two SEJ meetings in my time with BUC, and they were both last year. I have taken a leadership role in social justice twice in my time at BUC. First, I was invited to lead a discussion group about a chapter from a book on environmental justice. The second was starting an anti-racism workshop series this year, which was canceled due to quarantine. It's true that I invited my partner to lead a workshop on gender identity, but um, I need people to be able to use the right pronouns for them. All of our welcome renewal work was done by lay leaders with the exception of a prayer I gave on World AIDS Day. I think I also went to two or three of the meetings for that team. And I'm ashamed to admit this, but when they approached me about taking on welcome renewal this year, I actually asked them not to do it. I was afraid that I would get comments like this. And then I did. And so here we are. Now, again, I realize that I'm a symbol of change in our congregation and change is hard for people. But it's also hard on me to be blamed for things that I haven't done, especially with the implication that one part of my identity has played a disproportionate role in my ministry and in the life of this church. Now, I know that none of you have asked these questions or made these statements because you want to hurt me, even the ones that have. You've said these things because our congregation means a lot to you and because you are passionate people. I want you to know that our congregation means a lot to me too. I hope that honest responses to your questions and your concerns can bring us to a mutual understanding of that commitment. Instead of trying to answer people on a one-off basis, I wanted to use this platform today to bring all these concerns out into the open and provide some guidance for how these decisions have been made and how these things have come to be. I respect you enough to tell you the truth. I believe that you have as much resilience as I do and the ability to handle tough conversations. If you can ask me, I can answer you. I believe that we're all in this together, working for the good of our church and our future together. It is the understatement of the year to say that there's a lot going on in the world right now. We have civil unrest, unhinged political rhetoric, a pandemic. I don't mean to add another thing to our complex emotional landscapes, but if there's ever a day to clear these things up, it's Daffodil Sunday. Daffodil Sunday is a celebration of taking risks in the name of greater understanding and love. BUC has always been proud of that history while continuing to work for the future. We are a community that values education and we value justice. That drove our welcoming congregation efforts back in 1994 and it drives us still today. If we are to remain relevant in the future, we must draw from our past. BUC was on the cutting edge of religious inclusion of LGBTQ people back in 1984 94, 1994. So why should we be anything less today? This is obviously an emotional subject for me. I've been misspeaking from the very beginning of our, of our time together today. 
I know that I have some sensitivity around this, but, um, you know, I left a mainline Protestant church that had raised me to find a place where I could receive this welcome. And I hope that you will continue to join me in doing that work. I had actually thought that I would spend today talking about that process and talking about my history, but this felt more important. I meant to set us up for the annual meeting with a hurrah, we've been this congregation. But I felt like this was the better, the better option to have some real talk and some open dialogue and conversation. And I hope that we can still enter the uh, annual meeting from a place of hurrah and we've done a great job. We have done a good job and we can do more together. We strive to be a more loving, more inclusive, more gracious community today than we did yesterday. And we do that year over year to honor those who came before us and to make a place for those who will come after. Our religious tradition, our church, the human heart are limitless. Let us open them wide, ready for the challenges and the joy that will follow. So be it, amen and blessed be. Our last hymn this morning is number 168, One More Step. time that we have spent together and open wide those doors, open wide those hearts. May the sheltering walls of this congregation continue to be a place of love and hope and inclusion. And may you be as well. Amen. <laughs>